Hello and welcome. My name is Roger Furman from the UK Association for Accessible Formats, and we are very pleased to welcome Judith Furs to our July webinar. For nearly 30 years, Judith has been running her own Braille producing business. Her introduction to Braille began at an early age after losing her sight, and she remains extremely passionate about Braille to this day, as will become clear. Judith is a valued member of UCAF's editorial working group, and we're delighted this is the case. Judith, welcome, very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Your introduction to Braille began, I believe, in 1967. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Yes, um, well, I, I was desperate to learn Braille. I'd stopped um, being able to read print. And I was at the age, so I was six coming up for seven, the age where I had discovered the joy of reading. And then I had it snatched away from me. And um, I was, you know, devastated. Uh, and I was off school a long time because the local authority took a long time to get me into a special school. And um, eventually they got me into Linden Lodge. And I, my recollection is I just fell upon Braille. You know, this was going to give me um, the ability to read again. Uh, so I had a huge incentive to learn it. Um, and of course, I was at an age where you are very receptive. Um, and I just um, was so desperate to read again. And I had a very good teacher, uh, Miss Garling, um, who uh, was just brilliant. And I can remember that. So I remember the first lesson I did ABKL. I don't know if they still teach Braille in the same way, but um, they taught Braille in those days. Uh, but in, in a way as of um, sort of by shape almost. So ABK and L were very similar. Um, and then I think we went to DF and EI and so on. Um, and I learned the begin the sort of basics quite quickly. And I do remember the first day I was given um, contractions to learn. I had a little thermoform book and the first one was and. And I remember the page had, I think it was hat, the words hand, sandal. Um, oh, I can't remember the other ones, wasn't it? But it, that has stuck in my mind. I was just so thrilled. Um, to be able to read it. And they had um, the, the first series you did was something called the Gayway Books, which they wouldn't call it that today. Uh, and I know it started with the Little Red Hen. And I think we had Joe the Cat. And um, I just took to it really like a duck water. I just, it was just so wonderful to be able to read. And I sat next to, uh, in class, somebody called Peter Bosher, who many of you will know. <laughs> And he was a very competent Braille reader. He was quite fast and very competent. And sometimes uh, when it was raining, we couldn't go out to play at break time. He was asked to read to us and he read us Jennings books, I seem to remember. And I thought, I want to be able to read like that. You know, that was <laughs> so that was what I aspired to, to be able to read as fast as Peter Bosher. Um, mm. So, yes, that was my my beginning with Braille. Mm. Fascinating. It's really interesting. So from what you said, you clearly enjoyed the learning process. And did you encounter at that stage material that you really wanted to read for yourself, you know, choices of material that particularly appealed to you during that learning process? Yes, I, I did. Um, I was into Enid Blyton and as soon as I mastered enough grade two to be able to read that, um, I read those and I read some of the Jennings books for myself. Um, what I don't remember now is whether we don't think we had an actual library at Linden Lodge. I think probably Miss Garling just got out books she thought we would manage and and enjoy. Um, but quite early on, um, I did join the National Library and I always had National Library books around. Yeah. And, um, and there was, um, I, I felt, quite a reasonable amount of material that that sort of age range um, of, of books, um, say, Annie Blyson and uh, E.M. Nesbitt and those sort of the authors that were, were read by children then. They did seem to be um, quite a bit of material, yes. 
Yes, I, I myself remember getting material from the National Library and uh, I, that was a good way of obtaining reading. It certainly was. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure there was a limit to what Lyndon Lodge actually had themselves um, to give out to, to, mm. to children. And uh, it was, you know, it was wonderful. You know, it was a whole kind of um, treasure trove of, of, of books that you, you could have. So, um, yes, I, I really appreciated that. So I'm guessing that as you continued along this journey, that at some time you began to come across and use a variety of different braille codes during your education. Um, braille codes. Maths. Yes, indeed. Um, we did. We had maths and French. Mm -hmm. um, and those were the main ones at Lyndon Lodge. And of course, then when I went on to Chorleywood, um, I did German and Latin and um, and of course science, although we didn't do it to a very uh, high sort of standard, but you know we did it first and second year at school. Um, so yes, so there were there were different different codes um, we had to master. So and I did do a little bit of braille music. It was only up to oh, right. one. <laughs> oh, I did, oh, jolly, I did jolly. do a little bit. <laughs> yes. And how, how did you get on with the uh, the different codes and different systems that of languages that you were learning? Did I you find that they sat alongside the, the, your learning of the language and and the code that went with it? Yes, I think so. I I, know, I don't remember it ever being an issue. So I think that it just it was just part of what you did. And I think when you are at school and you are sort of in that age where you are still quite receptive um it isn't a big deal you know if i had to start from scratch now that might be a different a different thing but i think you just took it on board you know this was a french lesson and certain symbols were in, were part of the you know reading french and you just yes, just yes. took it as, as it came really as you say that's what you did that's what one did mm. and at this time did you find that you were being drawn to particular types of material you know, fiction, non-fiction, poetry, or anything else? I, fiction and poetry, really, um, which I just lapped up. I've always loved poetry, and I still do. I belong to a poetry group, and Braille is hugely important for that. You know, I couldn't participate if I didn't have Braille poetry books um, that I could take along and read poems out of, um, and, and fiction. And we had quite a reasonable library at Shorleywood, so um, you could usually find something to read, but I still, I was still a member of the National Library, um, so I was still reading those as well. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that for most of that time, initially I read fiction. I mean, now I read all sorts of different things, but fiction was the thing I was most drawn to. Yeah. Particularly yeah. historical fiction. I've um, loved sort of Mosby Sutcliffe and uh, Geoffrey Treese and those sorts of authors and there was a reasonable amount of that in Braille um, so that was my sort of favourite go-to um, reading material really. So as you continued your education at Chorleywood did you have any strong feelings about what you might develop as a career? Um, I wanted to be a solicitor and I did, in fact, take a law degree, but I failed the solicitor's exams twice, so I gave up on that. Um, and then I decided I would like to work um, in the health service in a community health council, as they were then, and they were the um, patient voice in the health service, and I felt very passionate about that. And I did get shortlisted um, for some jobs, went for lots of interviews, didn't get any of them, you always suspect it's because you can't see, but you can't prove it. Mm. Um, I did do some voluntary work in the local community health council and, and, and got on, on with it fine. Um, and then somebody told me, oh, I did I did another job working um, in the 80s when so many people were unemployed. The what was then called the Manpower Services Commission, which I think now would be DWP, used to run these schemes which were supposed to be an introduction to work and were really just to get you off the statistics. But I actually did one which was um, educating people about the problems of deafness. 
and it was actually really enjoyable. We would work in a team and we'd go into schools and shops and places and um, talk about the problems of deafness. And it was, I loved it. Some of the children were sort of slightly confused that a blind lady had come to talk about deafness, um, but it was, it, 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 it was great fun. Um, but my first proper job was working at what was then Pembridge Place, now the uh, RNIB College is at Loughborough, uh, teaching Braille on the telephony course and working with some adults who just lost their sight on a one to one basis. And somebody had told me this job was going, so I applied and got it and it was a fixed term. They just needed somebody to fill in for one term because somebody was away. Um, and I, I loved it. I loved teaching. And they said to me, you know, if we could find you a permanent post, would you stay? And I said, yes. Uh, but they couldn't. But somebody in my team knew that they were looking for proofreaders at RNIB. So uh, I applied for a job as proofreader at RNIB and I got a job on the magazine team. Um, but when they were moving to Peterborough, I didn't actually particularly want to go to Peterborough. So I took my redundancy and um, I hadn't been sort of off work for more than a couple of weeks and they rang me up, the RNIB rang me up and said, would you do some proofreading? Because they had assumed that the visually impaired staff would all go to Peterborough rather than be unemployed. And actually not many of them did. So uh, they didn't have enough proofreaders. So I would proofread um, and I did that for ages. I mean, I did it till, and so what would happen was the weeks that I had work, I didn't sign on and then, you know, I, I, and then when I didn't have any work, I signed on. So that eked out my unemployment benefit for quite a long time, actually. But eventually you, I ran out and I was only signing on to get my national insurance paid. And that's quite complicated because you can only work so many hours. And somebody said, why don't you just go self-employed and be a transcriber as well? And I, I said, oh, well, I suppose I could give that a go. I hadn't really thought about doing it. But, it, you know, well, I do know about Braille. I haven't got to sort of retrain. Um, I did have to train to, to use the equipment, but, um, and so I did that, and that's how it started. So I sort of fell into it, really. I didn't set out to be a transcriber. Interesting journey, isn't it? And it's amazing all these different routes, and you're never quite sure where they're all going to lead, as as often things are in life. But so that was quite a while ago, and ever since you've been running your own your own transcription business and have you found that an enjoyable generally an enjoyable experience and doing a range of things no doubt that you've been doing uh, yes it's not always enjoyable um you sometimes feel very harassed people often want things yesterday yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know um, the feeling. Don't, <laughs> they don't understand what's involved um and um Yes, it, it, so I would say that, um, but I I do feel very strongly about Braille. You know, I do think people are entitled to have information in a format they can read. Mm -hmm. And so I have always looked at it from that point of view, you know, that somebody, if they need something doing, they, they, should, they should have it. Um, and some things are a bit tedious, you know, if you're brailing, hundreds of bank statements you know it's not terribly intellectually very satisfying but you do have the satisfaction of knowing somebody's going to be able to read their bank statement mm -hmm. and you do sometimes get some really interesting things i remember brailing somebody was doing a postgrad about the um apollo 13 mission and asked me to braille some of the communications between um ground control and apollo 13 so that was really interesting so you do sometimes get something that is actually really, you know, really interesting um, and, and gives you a lot of satisfaction. Um, yeah. I've been over the last few years proofreading SATS papers and that's been a real eye opener. You know what children have to know these days, particularly in maths. I think, goodness me, you know, I don't think I could have done these papers, uh, you know. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, it's uh, but mostly it's the satisfaction, I think, of um, of, of producing something somebody wants and I do actually get um, some satisfaction from you know you get a, a document and you know you run it through the software and then you're sort of going through it and some documents just come out really as a mess and there's a, there is satisfaction I find in sorting it out 
you know, and actually going through it and making something into a shape that somebody can actually read. Um, so that is that gives me job satisfaction as well. Yes, that's yeah. that's that is certainly very true. When I know sometimes you can be doing a, lo a lot of things that you you or might be considered routine, and you you you're asked to do something that you that you personally find really really interesting. Uh, so I like you proofread for clear vision, um, and I mm -hmm. do love that. I love proofreading the children's books. That's yes, and it's uh, it's 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 just so good to know that people are learning braille needing this type of material because as we all know it's just so important in people's lives to have these literacy skills for what whatever they may be going to do in life yeah. particularly with employment obviously during during your lifetime with braille uh, there have been changes to the code changes to the system i wonder if you have a professional perspective and a personal one about this yes um i think some changes have perhaps been better than others um so from a personal point of view you can get used to reading almost anything if you're a fairly proficient reader and uh, but i i have to say don't like some of the changes, don't like UEB. Um, however, it's here with us. So, you know, just had to kind of get on with it. Um, I do feel um, a bit concerned. We've had quite, over the years, we've had quite a few changes. Now, some haven't been huge. So take changing the EA sign, so you do E and then an AR sign, has not been a huge change. And although a lot of people personally who I know still do in the EA sign because that's what they were taught at school and, you know, they, for personal reasons, they've never had to, to change it. You know, why mm, should they yeah, really just write yeah. to friends or whatever? Um, I actually fit, don't feel that's a difficult one. And I actually quite like the shape um, under your fingers with the E and the R, AR sign. I actually think it looks quite nice. So um that wasn't a kind of big deal but i do think and i and i could see the sense behind some of the the um changes so for instance the sequencing you know we don't run and fall the together anymore and i get that you know if you're learning braille um it's much easier to read them spaced out that's how you would write them you know in a sighted world uh so although when i'm writing for myself i still run them together um i i can i can get that um, I feel much more concerned about introductions, for instance, the type form indicators. Mm -hmm. I really feel that, particularly when I'm dealing with children's material, there are just too many dots. You know, you could have something in print that's bold and underlined and in block capitals. Before you ever get to the first word, you know, you've got a two cell sign for bold two cell sign for underline and three dots for the capitals. Um, and I I just I just feel that's that is too much. And I um, fortunately Clear Vision take a fairly pragmatic view. So we look at it, you know, is this important um, for the reading of the story? If something needs to be emphasized, then obviously it should be emphasized, but do we need every single indicator? Mm -hmm. um, I use Duxbury um, for my transcription and it Duxbury just throws everything into it, you know, everything and the kitchen sink. You know, if it's emphasised in, in print, you'd often get bold and italic. And and I spend a lot of my time just stripping lots of this stuff out. You know, I say to myself, OK, what do they need? What do they need to be emphasised? Uh, how do we make this this sensible? And, you know, they don't need all these signs. You know, you don't need the bold and the underline in this context. And so I take it out. I, I do find that frustrating. I know people say well, that's what you should do. You should use your common sense. Why write the software so that it throws it all in in the first place if you don't need it? You know, I just feel really frustrated about that. Um, and I do worry about a bit with UEB. And I may be being really unfair about this, but I sort of feel that there was a, a little bit of let's make it easy for the computer programmers and not enough of let's make it easy for the people reading it. And I just worry that it is putting people off you know i know people who stop reading magazines for instance 
because mm. they just can't stand all these extra dots. And if it, and it, and it feels clumsy, you know, lots of, some symbols yes. left on, and this sort of thing. And I just think that is so sad. And I understand, you know, why people are, are, are saying, you know, we needed a unified code, etc. And as I say, we're not we're not going to go back now. But I do wonder. Um, whether there's still room for improvement, shall we say, or, um, yes, or, yes. or, 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 or change, you know, and it has been a big change. And I know people say that uh, print changes. I think it's different. I mm. really do. I think if you're a sighted person and you are able to sort of see a page at a glance, you are not going to be thrown so much as if you are going along with your finger. And particularly if you're not a very fast reader, you know, you're sort of going over each sign fairly slowly and you you know I and you just think yes you know that's going to make it more difficult for some people yeah, so, yes yes I, I think in some ways this is a story still to be told in some ways because I know people who say that you know like it or not one has to accept that they are entitled to have a view about UEB and that the view is not always oh this is absolutely wonderful that they say it's the enjoyment of reading that they find particularly difficult with UEB. And, it, and as you say, it is really sad that people have stopped reading magazines because of it. So I think the untold bit is what will people in future generations feel about all of this, uh, or literally, and, and also yeah, in themselves, whether everything has worked out as well as it could have done. I just wonder whether the software might get a, a touch more sophisticated or th that you can have the option for choosing, selecting whether certain things are automatically transcribed or not, depending upon a particular transcription. I don't yes. know. Yes, so, I mean, that, that, that might, might be that uh, might. a solution. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I would be interested to know as well whether some research would be done as to whether it has made a difference to how many people are learning braille and how they found it i would be very interested to know to know that information um and if it, if if it's encouraging people to learn braille and they're you know mm. say, then great i absolutely you know whatever gets people into braille is, is good and i would be happy with that agree mm -hmm. i certainly agree with that now claire i'm wondering do we have any questions might be able to ask Judith? We do. Um, do you find people unfamiliar with Braille find it interesting to learn about it? Yes, I do. Um, I, I, I find people are very interested and, um, you know, when I'm using it, so I use it in church and um, people come up to me and they'll want to sort of run their fingers over it and ask me how it works and um, I did do a, a session for a group at church once actually they wanted me to talk about braille production and uh, I took some braille along and I said right I'm going to tell you now you know what the dots are and going to shut your eyes and see how you get on um, and uh, they, they, they found that really interesting and I've done talks for brownies and scouts and so on and yeah they, I think children particularly love it you know they just find this is really fascinating you could do something with your fingers um uh so yes when people see you reading braille i often get asked about it that's good good that people are curious to uh, learn about how somebody else encounters the world encounters information really so that's good claire any others Yes. Do you have storage problems with large quantities of hard copy Braille? Yes. Um, I'm very fortunate that I, I do have quite a lot of space, but the trouble with having a lot of space is you fill it up. And um, my um, sighted assistant um, every now and again says, will you stop buying books? <laughs> They're all over the place. <laughs> Um, and so, um, yes, it, 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 it is an issue. Um, and I feel very, as I say, I feel very lucky that I have got quite a bit of space, but you do kind of come to a sort of limit. And I don't know what the answer is really, because brain is just big, you know, it just takes up space. And uh, there's 
there's not a lot you can do about that really. No, I think we all encounter that kind of issue, don't we? Do you find that for pleasure that um, reading digitally is a way forward for yours? Is it that the hard copy is really I, part part of the experience for you and the, and the need as well? Yeah, I like the hard copy, really. I do sometimes read things digitally. Well, and obviously a lot of stuff comes to me via email. You know, I'm a hospital governor. I get lots mm. of reports to read. And I read those digitally. I don't print all those off. I would be disappearing on no. a mouse paper. Um, but things that I'm going to want to keep reading, like my poetry books, uh, absolutely hard copy. You know, it would not be the same. And I can't even describe to you exactly why that is. But I think it's something to do with your relationship with the book. You know, you are actually reading the book mm. and, you know, it's all there on the page. And also you can refer backwards and forwards more easily. Um, but um, and I with my poetry, I said I belong to a group and we take the books along to read. You know, we have a theme and we choose poems and then we go and we read the poems and discuss them. And I mean, I I don't have a portable digital device, um, so I take the books um, and. There's just something about that, having the book to look through, flicking the pages backwards and forwards, you know, reading bits of poems. Uh, it isn't, it, yeah, I, I like to have the, the hard copy, really. And I do things I need the hard copy for, really. You know, I chair meetings um, at church, for instance, and I need to have the hard copy agenda under my fingers. Um, it, that's easier if you've just got a bit of paper so, rather than taking a device along. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a hard copy girl. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, there is something about feeling the Braille in the context of the page where it is, how the lines. And so it's, it's a different, it is a different experience, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Um, I think particularly with poetry, mm, you know, how it's set out is important. Yeah, yes, it's and part of uh, part of telling a story. And yes. um, that's... Uh, all part of it and of, you know very important part of it and it's uh, it, it just shows that there is still a need for hard copy braille and it's not all going to just go digital and that'll be that uh, and as you say that from the reference point of view there is something that you can just flick a, f a few pages back and forward if you're look, you know, wanting to refer to different parts of a poem or whatever it is you're reading. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Well, Judith, I'd like to thank you very much for being our guest and for sharing your insights about Braille. And obviously, uh, thank you to Claire for the administrative side of this webinar. In August, we will be joined by Sophie Randall from the Patient Information Forum. So do join us then. Until next time, goodbye from us all. So goodbye. <laughs>